Yeah, we can record this if you uh, if you got got it. Yes. We're we're on the same way like now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's cool. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so on our side here, the, we freeze proofed, like kind of blew out the pipes for the different houses. Uh, we're winter safe. Uh, we're, uh, yeah, my mind is like, yeah, uh, still got to finish that house. So I'm playing out the, just, just, uh, spending actually quite a bit of time, uh, still doing some optimization of the design. Cause for example, like, like, uh, say the bathroom kitchen stuff, like that's, We've got the concept, but it's not technically designed yet. So before I'm going to go out there and build that, I'm doing um, a lot of the design build docs as well, which all goes into the big doc, the big documentation of how we make this an excellent experience for people where everything is well documented and really streamlining everything. So we're, we're you know, narrowing things down. Like the latest, latest thing was just deciding on vinyl siding of all, all else. As the way to go we were doing with the wood panels then we tried to go to the, the these fiber cement panels explored that i think um vinyl siding that's also going to look very attractive because we're going to put like wood trim like cedar trim on that and stuff like that so uh, a lot of different optimizations happening but really thinking yeah man like <laughs> uh i mentioned 250 bucks an hour uh come to our school if you drop out, you can become a redneck and still make 20, 250 bucks an hour. <laughs> That's our promise, man. Cause I, I was thinking a lot about the, yeah, I actually started writing down the, as far as the four year program, I basically yeah. took all the stuff that we have, all the design lessons. And I did a big throwdown of here's um, five days a week times. It was like 200 uh, getting towards like 200 lessons, just granular topic by topic. Uh, here's the, like the technical training. Uh, but also, let me just send you the link link this so you know. It's Saturday I did this, but the idea there is um, it would be a hard sell to charge a person twenty five thousand dollars for a college level thing without accreditation, without certification. Um, but that's kind of how I'm, I want to play it. Uh, like this year, we had one hundred seventy k revenue. That's actually better than we have ever done, like from programmatic revenue. Uh, we did a Kickstarter. We did maybe like 120K one year. We're at like 170. So it's actually going up a little bit. That's cool. Uh, seeing some product of that. Um, but as I think about the next step, the apprenticeship, the the sh super short time, it's just, that's, that's the bothersome stuff. It's not enough to communicate this. Like uh, when I think about the long-term uh, survival of this work, ain't going to happen without cloning more of me, people who can go through that whole design process. So starts by learn to design and build anything, learn how to collaborate, learn how to solve problems by first identifying them. So that the three-step program, um, but it would take like four years. I'm excited about teaching that, but how the hell are we going to do that? All I'm going to do, do is go forward. Okay, here's the curriculum on one side. And maybe if we do this four-year school, possibly in the background of it is if we have the house as a real enterprise, then, as I mentioned, uh, drop out, become a redneck, and still make 250 bucks an hour, kind of thing. Uh, but that's that's where I'm at in my psychology. Um, um, the thing that I want to be very clear about is going to the future uh, with experience of the apprenticeship, where I was hoping that, oh yeah, we're going to get all these people ready to do all this stuff. No, it takes more more time. Uh, but we got to get there to the point where we got the longer programs is going to be much attrition just like there was much attrition this year uh, but we're gonna to have to explore it and and make it happen so uh, that's my update awesome um i don't have anything to add to that i think i think the work we're about to do is a step in that process yeah yeah because if we if we develop the revenue model around so this if this is the actual workshop yeah that could be replicated too that's a uh, and if it if it builds around the current house that we're producing, that's marketing and all of that. Now, just one question on that though, is like when I would think about product strategy, we know that two story is much harder than one. And the current model that we have that we're deploying is the two story one. And that's just uh, just kind of in the back of my mind as something like Katarina mentions, oh yeah, since, wait, do we talk about the, the idea of micro house, micro houses or tiny houses? No, we haven't. But I, I saw the slide that you had on our planning document. Yeah, like 
after I talked to you, I, she was like, oh, what do we do? And she, of course, says, to, she, as a woman, and, you know, uh, less physical. Like, to me, it was like, I never really noticed the two-story thing until this year. Because when, whenever we did it, we had a big swarm, and it was great. It was fun. But yeah, it is, it is serious business. To go into two stories versus one is different. And it's harder, by all means. Because and it gets into safety and uh, to to actually get the modules up to the second floor, that's a different story than laying them up on the first floor, uh, where you okay. stand them off right off the ground. Um, but anyway, that's just something I'm throwing out there, uh, because maybe there's a um, uh, there's a possibility of reframing that towards micro house builds or smaller house builds, or maybe like the workshop is the 500 square feet which is not the two stories, maybe just the first floor or something. Uh, now, uh, Katrina mentioned that, oh, how about if we do it where you, br you build your micro house on wheels, uh, your tiny house, but I'm just not seeing a revenue model with that. Like how many people are gonna, like, I don't know. I'm not seeing a revenue model no. on it. Like, I could see like charging decent money for a bunch of people to show up. Um, because we had 18 people show up to this this time around. Um, but the people who are going to get their mi micro house on wheels or their tiny house, they'll be excited. But how many people are you going to, would be also be paying clients for that? So I don't know. I'm not seeing a clear yeah, clarity on that. It, well, it's, it's definitely not a fully developed market. So, you, so I could say I'm confident there's a market for tiny houses. The people who are building them currently have enough time and income to do it on their own. And so the service you would be selling that existing population is a rapid construction at a discount basically, because they're gonna get the efficiencies of the OSC method. And so you would wanna design the revenue model around, let's say a couple who are interested in making it their permanent residence. And there, there is a precedent for this, which is, and, and I actually have some connections to this community, uh, this thing called van life. So there are there is a community of people who take a year mm. off from the military. They buy a van, live out of it, and just travel around the country. And so potentially, what you could do is market to them and say, like, you don't need to buy a van and and trick it out. You just need to get a vehicle that can tow a tiny house that you're going to build. We're going to teach you how to do it. That to me could be a, a a huge opportunity. The, the only problem is the revenue model would have to be set up for like couples or singletons to be able to afford to, to show up, build the house and then drive it off. In other words, like the swarm build is you're envisioning a crew of people who are going to build this house and then sell it to the client under the model you just described. It's people who are going to be the owners of the house. The clients are the people who show up. They're paying you for the instruction and they're paying you for the material basically to build the house. Mm -hmm. they, they provide the labor and so <clears throat> i mean you 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 kind of have it already on the slide where you say 12 people per build for four for four tiny homes you know i think if the ratio were two people per tiny home and then you just up the amount you charge them because it's going to take longer uh to build with two people but like that 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 is the unit economics to me you know, tiny home you you know if they're if they're going to drive it off the lot then unless you unless you separate it to people who are just showing up for the instruction and learn how to do it and the only two or one of the people are part of the crew are the clients uh so let's see um let me look at the, the doc uh, again so, um So build a crash course operations manual. Ooh, nice branding on the top left. Well, I saw you um, did it to the other slides. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can take it off. <laughs> no, 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 don't do it. Um, uh, page four. Right. What do you think about that? Two weeks, uh, two weeks, 
48 people, but how do you get 12 people to, you get a couple, how do you get 10 people to support them and pay for this experience? Maybe, maybe it's like very low cost. It's like, um, very low cost for support people. Right. Because the people, the people who get the home, get the home, pay a bit, <clears throat> pay, pay a lot for the service. Right. Right. Um, well, it, two weeks. Th this yeah. this may this this may be out of like may not work economically, but if you if you look at the cost in terms of time and money that two people would take to build a tiny house house on their own, like they're currently doing, I bet you you could still come under that number, and. Uh, put it on the shoulders of the two people who are actually going to take the home off the lot as the owners and maybe even compensate. So like the money, like you could potentially pay the support people out of the cost of the home that the people are, are buying. They're just, they're still getting a discount relative to what they would have to do if they were doing this on their own. So you're like, you're basically saying like, if you have the money in two weeks of your time, you can show up and drive a tiny home off of the lot. Yeah. I would just have uh, to investigate that, what a tiny home costs currently. Yeah. It could be a wide range. Like, I don't know, like, um, yeah. That's figure, but a figure that comes to mind, like maybe say 30K, you can pay 60K, you can pay 100K. Um, but for van life, is that a thing that's, that's based on, that's typically, that comes out of like army people? Uh, the, the, the connection i have so there's a instagram account um captain kayla um, let me see if i can find her website captain kayla um actually let me i'll pull up her website here we go so uh this is someone i have a relationship with through social media and she is a she's a vet and she published this blog when she, she separated from the military and then spent a year or two on the road doing the van thing. And she's got a bunch of followers and um, is just like a cool person. You call her an influencer. Um, but I, she would be my, the first person I would go to to ask like, hey, this is, this is sort of what we're thinking what's your sense of the market? Because she, and, and like, I've got another friend I, I collaborate with who uh, is in the climbing community and the climbing community is huge on the van life thing. Because when when one says van life is that, um, but you said what you said, it happens that the person is ex-military, Kayla? Yeah, Kayla? Kayla is a former army officer. Um, but when people say van life, they don't associate, oh, that's the thing that Correct. typically military people, they're like way into that. It's for everybody. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. you know, uh, to maybe me, find out about it. Okay. It, let me uh, make a note before I forget. I mean, that's, that's a viable thing. I mean, um, it's actually interesting if you have a thing that, you put on a frame then my immediate thought was okay this is cubes like structural frames lattice frames so you can actually stack them like shipping containers so if you think about making a, a settlement you can literally say oh well a, a real house a big house is actually a few of these together so, so right. try to get the cost down so you can actually make a much larger space but design it in the same way that we do do which is designed for expandability so if you want to make this into a core of your permanent house that's a possibility. Like it would be like the kitchen, the core utility module and stuff like that. So, so there's some creativity that can, can happen there. Um, but uh, product development, I mean, we don't have that product. We do have the CD home. Um, so this would be kind of a, a, a diversion now, diversion in terms of we don't have that product here now, but the, the collaborative potential there as well, if we could find some collaborators that are open in this and want to, uh, create better, bigger, better, faster, stronger with open source doing this, 
then I'll be a call out for that kind of collaboration because I've yet to find the first ever person who does open source hardware enterprise. Right. Um, I, I did want to bring up sort of, your, we're, we're talking about the gap between the four-year model that you want to implement and where we currently are. And accreditation is in the way of that. Um, to con you know, convince people to spend twenty five thousand dollars. So, to me, the path to accreditation and approval, or recognition, credibility, however you want to frame it, is um, is two things. One is the proprietary, non vocational school exemption, which we've we all we have to do is submit the curriculum for the swarm build, and file for exemption. And there's no time constraint on that. It's, it's however long we want to take to do that. That's one. And then two is a shorter apprenticeship. That's the DOL. So I think that we're still, and now tying back into what you just said about like, we don't have a tiny home modular thing built. We only have a CD go home. I think the tiny home model is going to be easy to implement once you prove the swarm build model for the seed eco home and it generates some revenue, then I think that the product development for the tiny home becomes a secondary course option run in the same fashion as the seed eco home. So all of the systems that you have on site are in place with the product you have, and then you can expand it to other products and replicate wow. as you prove that model. That That's kind of how I see. So like, because you're right, I think taking time to do a modular design of the tiny home for a swarm build may unnecessarily delay what you actually need right now, which is like an MVP for. Yeah, um, which we have. Right. You know, believe it or not, the, the materials that we have right now, like if you wanted to build in Kansas City, it's like we already have a half a house. It's all the framing. Yeah. You know, that, that's actually when you stop back and think about it, the idea of recycling the materials is pretty cool. Yeah. And you have to if it's can, an upfront cost it's a large cost but it's a one-time cost yeah yeah uh, another thing that comes up is i in one of the courses i took about green building they talked about construction site waste is a huge issue um yeah. is there a version of the cd go home system where you would show up and then part of the building be disassembling the existing structure and then organizing that material to reuse uh, sorry, I'm missing the question. So, uh, what's the question? It's like, let's uh, say we reuse, we reuse like 100% uh, in terms of construction waste, uh, working on it, like as in going to zero construction waste. That's that's our goal. Well, yeah. What what I'm saying is, let's say let's say Kansas City has a uh, 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 what they call um, condemned housing or something. They they've got a block that's abandoned. It's all condemned housing. OSC as a service could be like, all right, we're going to show up, we're going to disassemble the existing structure, we're going to take all the material that we can reuse, and then apply it to our CDFO home model. And mm, oh, interesting, else, yeah. And mm. then and then supplement whatever we can't recover uh, from the on site, so that you get two services: you get the the removal of the existing structure, so it's just controlled demo, and then you also get a new structure in its place that is reusing existing material instead of just putting it in a dumpster. Um, and the question is, have we, are we interested in that? Or is that feasible? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, this is further down the road, but as a, yeah. as a value proposition for a really yeah. any client. Yeah, no, it, it, there's actually, um, the quick answer to that is, is the supersized shredder. You shred that thing and turn it into like pellets for wood heat. You can turn it back into gravel, like with a massive shredder. We're, we're working on a shredder right now. We're, we're doing one right now, but the idea there is now you're, you're munching up like urbanite or concrete. You're munching up wood, for example, for wood mulch. So, so you go in there and out the other side, you have a bunch of marketable products and that's, that requires heavy capital, but that's that in terms of machinery to do that. But that's kind of what we specialize in. So that's something we can really, really dent once we have all these machines fully up and running. 
Yeah. Right. Okay, cool. I just wanted to throw yes. it out there. Yeah, uh, as far as your sequencing idea, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's like we we develop the model on a seed home, and then we can diversify into the here's the tiny house on wheels, things like that. Yeah. So on the seed home, I, I got back a day early. They postponed the launch again. We had to come home. So um, I don't know. I I deviated from your template a little bit. Um, mm. Sure. Do you want to do you want to go up and see how I was sort of envisioning this from a uh, planning standpoint? Yeah, go ahead, man. Yeah, this is good. Um, yeah, I mean, they, I don't know that these are the final categories on the left hand side from top to bottom planning down to logistics. But when I was looking at the other document, this seems sort of like the framework I would use initially. Um, and I sort of incorporated this with um, this training eight step training model from the army to come up with a, what I thought made sense for a sequence. And then I just applied the existing timeline. So if our goal is April 1st, which is a Friday, we have 148 days from today. D1 minus 148. Oh, I like it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, I think that the, this is arbitrary, but November, December, the big rocks are you're, you're typing in one, which is finalizing the product development, the curriculum dev. So what exactly is the scope of what we're teaching and how are we balancing that with the shit we actually have to accomplish on site? Um, I think the promo video production is the big marketing task. And I also think that it's worth announcing a teaser so you know this could be before the the video is done or it could just be something on the website coming soon because we want to plant the seed in people's minds um are uh, you talking about the d-day about the yeah. first uh, ongoing event in this in the crash course yeah. series yeah yeah huh. um for for november december <laughs> Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of like building capacity, I think identifying the mm -hmm, instructor mm -hmm. instructors is going to be one of the toughest parts um, because you're, you need special people to fill that role. And mm. we have to figure out what's going to incentivize the right kind of person to come out and how do we reach them early enough to get them on board to commit. Um, mm -hmm. one idea I had, and you'll see it in sort of like that middle column is if we have a, a single application for everybody from the applicants, potentially you could identify the people who could serve as instructors based on their backgrounds. All right. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, you, you I, could, I got distracted. Hold on a second. Can you en enable me to share my screen? Mm -hmm. Just give me one second. Because um, when when you're recording, you you're recording what, like a double window. Correct. I think I just did. Okay. Because uh, wait, let's see. Share screen. Screen one. Yeah. Um, yeah, because now, for example, can you see like the yep. stuff here? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, so take a look at this thing. Uh, this is what I'm thinking for. This is our next step. And yes, there's intermediate steps, but like we said, whatever happens with anything else, this is going forward. Like I'm going to be working on it whenever I can. Uh, here's the link to to that. Since I didn't. Okay. Um, instructors, sorry, before you got distracted on this thing. So, so regarding what's, what's the, uh, can you repeat the last thought before <laughs> yeah, 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 you yeah. waylaid? No worries. You have a single application. So you make this announcement saying that this event's going to happen in April and you say, here, the, here's the application window. You can apply either to attend or you can apply to attend as an instructor. If an instructor will pay you, if you just attend, here's what the tuition costs. 
tell now tell us why you want to be an instructor or why you think you can be an instructor we only have four mm. small oh, like spots or whatever. so like, like that's one way if you if you have trouble reaching back to people you think you already know in your network that are qualified to do it or having a separate application this is the alternative yeah uh, but you you got that um you got that for november december no you got that for january instruct applications yeah, that, yeah i mean it, sorry. It's, it's all, it's all kind of arbitrary i was just thinking in terms of sequence um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we might want to iron out the specifics of the the event so what what is the curriculum what's the scope of the day-to-day -day learning and how are we balancing it, like teaching people with actually putting the walls up um because when we do the full announcement media blitz whatever you want to call it we want to paint a very clear picture of what people are applying to so that's the only reason i have it Jan Feb, um, with an with a teaser early on to get it on people's radar. Where's the actual curriculum? Where do you got that going on? It'll be uh, it's in the full announced. The full top uh, or at the top, where next to planning. planning. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. There we go. Uh, planning curriculum development. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. So I'm going to do this building cra builder crash course. Uh, curriculum developments see that on um, wiki page. So that means we go to here. Uh, I can link that to so we'll start yeah, yeah. I mean, I can start throwing stuff in there. Um, so I'll link that to the doc. Yeah, that's that's a big one. Um, yeah, I mean, getting uh, the quality of this depends on. Okay, here's being the efficiency part, where we've got everything so scripted, so tight, that yeah, you better believe it. It's worth this, and we'll get a lot of turnout. Yeah. Right. Uh, that goes into the announcement teaser, like the more confident we are in that, um, <clears throat> the better, the more, I mean, we do have uh, advantages. We do have is we do have a lot of good footage. Yeah. Um, but to convert it from where we are right now to D-Day, April 1. Yeah. Uh, just a lot of refinement, just a lot of streamlining and yeah. Cool. <laughs> I, I guess, you know, everything else on here, this is a living document. Um, I, I don't know if it's comprehensive enough, um, but I think given what's on your plate, right? Like your day-to-day -day is still manual labor to finish the existing building and you're refining the product as we speak. And so then like to, the next question I would have is how do I supplement you know, with you know, to help take tasks off of your shoulder or other people. I mean, like, you know, who, who's involved here that can um, collaborate with us and, mm -hmm. and, and how do we assign them tasks to chip, start chipping away at some of this? Right. Good question. Um, when can you visit um i mean it's it's fairly flexible i've got some family stuff in november i have to stick around for uh, around thanksgiving time um i mean well, if i came out what is what is the goal or what do you sort of envision as being like the the to-do list because that may dictate when i come out and for how long like what, what would I be doing to really help you out? Um, <laughs> we can be building the house. Yeah, you, you literally we, just need a body. Can, 
weekend of house build. That's the only practical thing. The other stuff we can, the idea was to meet in person. The rest of the stuff is all kind of stuff you can do remotely. And the biggest thing on my side is, so for summer X to end, cause we're still, we still got the program and we've got four people on site still. So we're still going at it uh, every day and weekends are off. Um, so uh, in the meantime, yeah, I'm doing spending whatever time I got thinking about the build and building and stuff like that. Um, as far as what's your time budget that you can commit to in terms of any work regarding this, the the, the prep for the the builder crash course? Um, well, I, I mean. I, I consider this one of two uh, permanent projects I'm working on for as a part of Alice Incorporated. And I structure my days nine to five. I eat, you know, m Monday through Friday, basically. So the other project I have on my plate is something called the ETS sponsorship program, but they're keeping me at arm's distance for now. And I'm only participating as needed. Um, so the answer is quite a lot of time. And I'll be the first person to tell you if there's a conflict. Where do you see this going in terms of like, what's your vision for, collaboration with OSE like how do you see this I want in terms of what what you get out of like okay so training vets um basically re having people rejoin civilian life and ha helping that transition along your core mission yeah because I, I do feel there's some good good synergy there so what's maybe we can start by defining the, the goals, the vision for wh where you, where we see this going. Yeah, my well, I, I'll have to I'll have to meander to to that endpoint. But my starting point is I want to rebuild the American dream, and I want it to be sustainable, just, and inclusive. And to me, that the the things we have to adjust. So like the the American dream I grew up with is. Everyone has a fair shot. If you work hard enough, you'll be successful. And I think that has to be adjusted for how fast the world is changing, specifically manufacturing leaving the United States, um, outdated expectations of work, um, unsustainable expectations of you know professional family balance. And <clears throat> What I get out of this partnership is an opportunity to transform the culture around people leaving the military and then re-entering society. So to me, this is about empowering, and it's not specific to veterans, this is just the population I'm starting with, saying like, look, when you leave the military, you're actually not constrained by the existing labor force. You can create your own future OSC is one organization that will provide you the tools to do that. All you have to do is show up with the right attitude, willingness to learn, a commitment to solving problems and a desire to join the community. Um, that's in a nutshell how I sort of envision the work I'm doing with veterans benefiting from a collaboration with OSC. But I think in one of the first calls that we had, I talked about, you know, this, this idea that education is something that's done to you. And like throughout the pandemic, there was all this controversy over the school's not doing enough. Kids, kids aren't getting enough out of, out of school because they're virtual. And I think all of that could be reframed as, you know, you live in a very prosperous nation with a lot of opportunity. And if you don't look at school as something that's done to you, but as an opportunity to better yourself, we have all those tools available to us. It's, a, it's really a matter of mindset. Um, and, then, and that was kind of one of the things I was most attracted to OSC about is 
like one of the best ways to learn STEM is to build shit and test it out and break it and get together with other people and collaborate. And to me, that that was like the best part of my education as an engineer. And another really powerful experience I had was going to my buddy's ranch in South Dakota, like the week after I took the fee, uh, after I graduated. And thinking that was hot shit as a mechanical engineer, and then seeing how his grandfather re-roofed his his barn using horses and pulleys and ropes and just understanding mechanical advantage, I was like, oh, I don't know shit. You know, I, I can fill out, I can I can solve a thermodynamics equation, but if I was if winter was coming and I had to to solve this problem or else my horses were gonna die, then I would I didn't have the tools to do that. And so, like to me, the cool thing about OSC is like. STEM is not an island of knowledge that is locked off from the rest of society. STEM has never been more accessible now and we limit ourselves by not going out and trying to build shit and solve problems around us. And at this point, I feel like I'm kind of meandering, but you know, in, more, in a more concrete terms, like for the veteran community, I see OSC as a waypoint from the military back to society for people who don't want to be constrained by like the existing education model or the existing employment model. And they think that through that experience, they can benefit their communities by having these skills and joining this community of people. Um, I think this could potentially be a, you know, an institution in which people leave the military show up and sort of ease back into society empowered by all the stuff that OSC gives them. For perspective, we've got the builder crash course we're working on, and then there's DOL, there's potential for this exemption stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm like kind of struggling how Any, any thoughts on, um, yeah, I like it. It's it's like all great stuff, man. It's, it, it, feel, it feels like words. Like it, I, I don't know if it's a sleep deprivation from having a one-year-old or what, but like all I do all day is sit around and think about like, what am I doing? How, how am I working towards my vision? Um, you know, it, like it, it, is this business accomplishing anything? And I don't know, my medicine are these meetings that I have with you where we get to talk about big ideas and, um, you know, ways, ways to progressively, you know, chip away at it. What do you see as like some, I don't know, any numbers or, or like, give me some numbers, man. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> How about I mean, impact? Yeah, 150,000 veterans between 18 and 35 leave the military every year who don't have a college degree. The utilization rate for the GI Bill right now is less than 50%. And of the people who use the GI Bill, 3% use it for employment. Which is to say, the vast majority of people who end up opting in to use their GI Bill use it for education. And to me, that's a missed opportunity for a couple of reasons. One, because it's like a huge economic um, surplus that we could essentially hand over to veterans to restart their civilian careers. And a lot of the barriers to entry for that are tied to the way, you know, the culture around, I need a four-year degree to be successful. And what that leads to is a lot of people going to college for shit that they're not really passionate about, they're not really interested in that about. And the opportunity cost is the opportunity to learn a, a, a marketable skill um, in the labor force. And so, you know, the, I, 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 I sort of see OSE as a, as a way to solve a lot of those problems that I just mentioned related to GI Bill utilization in a way that is like very productive for society. Yeah, I mean, the numbers, like for me, the, the numbers there, like if we tap a, a population of that as 
a formidable institution that's like, oh man, this is an opportunity. And imagine we we could we could get seventy five thousand people. Well, maybe not that many, uh, but uh, all that talent. You're seeing that the waste you're seeing is that. Well, why is that only fifty percent? Because but it's a lot of that is because of the misalignment. Like a lot of people might be like, well, I don't want to work in corporate America. It's like this college thing, right? That's, that's what we're trying to, to solve. Yeah. I think there's a lot of layers to this. So, so if you, if, if the question is why don't more veterans use their GI bill, why isn't the utilization rate higher? Uh, a part of that could be because they get jobs that they, some of them get jobs. And they, they don't need the GI Bill to make ends meet when they graduate. So that's some portion. And we don't really have good data on this. Um, another reason could be uh, they don't get into college or college doesn't interest them. Um, another reason could potentially be the number one challenge reported by veterans when they separate is navigating their benefits. So bureaucracy, red tape, it takes effort to unlock this, you know, taxpayer funded benefit. Um, and there's like even more, we can keep going down this road. I mean, another reason they don't utilize it is because there's a culture in um, the military right now that a lot of people are, are sort of bringing to light related to this dependency and uh, the, 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 the like disabled vet in sense of entitlement basically. And, Without getting too much detail, there's this new book out by um, this guy named Daniel Gade, who's a wounded, uh, combat wounded um, guy from Iraq and Afghanistan, who he chronicles the medical retirement process and sort of illustrates how the all of the incentives um, uh, drive otherwise capable people into thinking feeling entitled to to money and essentially lying on their disability exams to get as much compensation as possible and so we haven't as a like a military as a nation figured out the way to fairly compensate veterans for their service and you know the cost of service to them physically and mentally and empowering them to you know um move forward with their lives without you know feeling entitled to you know, permanent retirement disability. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why the rate utilization rate could be low. We may only be able to address some portion of that problem. But my whole thing is we're playing in, we're playing in an area that hasn't really successfully uh, been navigated before, which is unconventional education, unconventional routes to successful employment, um, culture change, you know, simultaneously collaborating within the system. So like we, you know, through our collaboration, we've recognized the need to actually work with these institutions as opposed to just saying, fuck it, we're doing this on our own. They can't help us. And I think you and I both recognize the reality of the world, which is they're extremely, these institutions are extremely powerful and necessary and throwing the baby out with the bathwater may not be like the right way to, to have an impact. So why, 
Are we here? I mean, I can tell you why I'm here. I, I'm here because I think there is a, a disconnect between what I see veterans are capable of when they're in service and how they struggle when they leave. And I think that mirrors a lot of what's happening at like across the country with people who are institutionalized, um, returned citizens, people who aren't participating in the labor force. Um, I think there's a lot of common threads. And I don't know, man, this, this, this idea of um, rebuilding the American dream, like, like my medicine is every time I talk to Mac, who was one of the first veterans I placed in South Carolina, he was, the, he was the guy in the video. He's, you know, he's in a much better place financially and as a person now than he was when we first met. And all that was, was establishing a human connection with him. And, you know, a, a human connection between him and his employer and sort of rethinking the job search and hiring process. And I don't see a reason why that can't be scaled uh, over the long term. I just don't want to take any shortcuts to get there. And you're the only organization I've found that really understands that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, man. We. I have no idea if any of this is landing. I don't even know if I'm making sense at this point. No, no, of course, of course. Um, I think I'm thinking like you need to come here for a weekend and we, we just talk about um, explore these issues in more depth. Like I think um, thing thing for me is like I want to like for me I'm in it for life. Like I think about system transformation. That's what I do for a living and trying to eke my way out into doing that um, and try to do it more ambitiously every year. For me, it's, it's a, it's a long-term thing. And um, I want to ask you what's um, so right now, so your wife works and you're able to do this, um, but it's like, do you see any risk for you to, to be able to continue doing this? Not unless she develops a taste for expensive handbags and fancy cars. I mean, we, we live within our means. I, I'm able to save to meet all my financial needs right now. Um, and to me, the risk, the, the bigger risk is taking a job I hate um, just to satisfy some like external validation or you know um climb some achievement ladder i i'm in this for life too it may not look or be called outlaws incorporated in the future but i'm i won't give up until i've determined that either i've solved the problem i set out to solve or i'm actively making it worse and so like i you know look i graduated in may and I decided a year and a half before that, my first semester of business school, that this is what I wanted to do. And I had opportunities to apply for internships and get a full-time job and do this part-time. But you know, the, another thing you probably don't know is I had a pretty serious injury when I left the military and, and that whole experience was very effective at aligning my priorities effectively. So this work allows me to eat dinner with my family every night be with my daughter um and you know through the power of zoom and google drive i'm able to still contribute to work i think is meaningful i mean if, yeah. if you're asking me about my commitment i'm committed tell me more about like um, what, what would be the ideal solution, like ideal state, like rebuild the American dream? Man, that's a big, that's a big statement, right? So what's, what's it mean for you? Like, like, say you look back, 
uh, on your life, what would you say that would be, what would be success for you on that? I mean, I think it would look like a generation of people who, um, feel empowered to solve the problems that they care about and have some shared value system that's based, you know, I, I think the, the Constitution and Declaration of Independence are miracles. And I don't, um, I recognize that it's kind of cheesy, but that's where I plant my flag philosophically. And like, I would like to see that sense of um, solidarity and quality as Americans play out in daily life um, so that your zip code doesn't determine how successful you are uh, or what kind of opportunities you have. And I think right now, that's kind of why in, in previous podcasts, I always say it, always, it comes to me, it comes back to inequality. This idea that Pod, podcasts. Yeah. In, in previous conversations I've had publicly, you know, I've, I've said that this, this idea all comes back, all things sort of come back to inequality for me. And I just, I, I think everyone should have a fair chance to solve the problems that they care about um, and build a life for themselves that's productive. Um, we have our next meeting starts in two minutes and it's on a separate link. Um, so I think this is a bigger conversation that I, I would love to continue. I just want to apply that. Yeah. I'm thinking like, um, <clears throat> you think it would be appropriate to have the bigger conversation when you come here, like maybe plan on coming for a weekend, like sat Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. I, I, I can definitely look at that. Um, to me, the biggest limitation to scheduling is childcare. So I just need enough time to make sure that my mother-in-law can come up and help out my wife while I'm gone. Um, or is, is bringing your child here an option or? Um, she's still nursing. So that would be probably logistically too tough. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, so um yeah but in terms of so i mean can you can you commit to to some date then or yeah or yeah I'll, I'll just have to um i'll just have to look at the look at the counter and get back to you now that now that we were sort of ironing this out i was like yes you want me to come it doesn't have to be with the department of labor visits you just want to have a sit down face to face with me Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let, let so me you can meet me and, and also. Yeah. Yeah, and you also get a chance to meet Katarina. <clears throat> Great. Cool. Consider no, that would be cool. Yeah. As far as yeah, so so do get back to me. As far as like okay, the Gantt chart and what to do. Uh, we made no progress on that, but maybe think about it. And I mean, are you saying that in terms of your time? I mean. Um. In term, well, I mean, to clarify the time budget thing, I mean, are, are you able to, are you saying like half your, your time you can commit to to working on OSC related stuff or is that, I'm just uh, saying that you said you've got two major projects. I mean, what, what other commitments do you have? Because I mean, that, that would totally depend, determine like what we can, you know, what we can talk about in terms of, okay, what, what are we going to accomplish together uh, towards the, the replicable builder crash course. Um, and what other things are in the way of that, because there's probably some other things that will come up, like say, I don't know, say the DOL stuff or anything else related to education opportunities. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to get a gauge for what. Like, like how, how I can answer, they... answer your question. Like, yeah, how much... How much time really can you dedicate to actually solving tasks that get us to to April one? I mean, every week is variable, just because it's that's sort of at at people's demands. Like, hey, I need you to take a look at this presentation. Speaking of the other projects I'm working on, and so like, 
all things are possible with enough advance notice, but I mean, practically speaking, 20 hours a week seems realistic. That's some serious time. So, I mean, uh, if that's the case, then um, I have to really think about that. And my mind is kind of an emotion, a sense that uh, as we wrap up the summer X here, it's like uh, there's somewhat of a conflict of interest in, in terms of having too many things on my plate. There's that, there's the house. Uh, so I, Lately, I just haven't. Um, Jeff left, and so I had to clean yeah. up the stuff for, 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 for winter, and we still got to do a couple of things on that. So it's been a little bit like it, but I, I can definitely, I, I'll put some brain juice into that, and uh, we okay. need we need to talk again on that. Okay. So maybe you want to um, hop over to the yeah. other meeting. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. I'll see you there. Yep. Bye bye. So send me this recording, please. So I can... Yep. I'll stick. Okay. Thank you.